my name is Ina Porras. I'm an economist, environmental economist, and I worked for over well over 20 years on um, environmental issues in developing countries. And I joined FCDO about two years ago now, and it's very exciting to be part of this nature journey that the whole organization is supporting and all the work that the UK is doing internationally as well. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share with you a few reflections on Costa Rica's own nature's learning journey. And I'm going to focus on payment for ecosystem services, which is um, talked quite a lot internationally. Um, it's common to hear about this program, about the, the, the state and the, the, the great things that Costa Rica small countries do in an environment. And it's easy to think that that has been the case all the time, but this is not the case. So full disclosure, as Andrew said initially, I am from Costa Rica, so I'm, um, I know the, um, the, the evolution of all of these uh, programs quite well. And, um, um, and it was actually the place where I began my career as an environmental economist, so probably the best and most active hub in the world. Um, so the picture on the left, this um, dry area, it was really a common sight all over Costa Rica when I was growing up in the 70s. Uh, land clearing had certainly not been curved at all, so we, we talk about the need to do this curving, otherwise it will continue decreasing. Costa Rica was massively over here when I was a child. And it really looked, the slope was really downward and it was very slippery. So what I'm going to talk is a little bit of what were actions that helped turn um, this trend and moved us into more of this thing that we tend to see now um, on, on the right. So, um, this sequence of maps that um, appearing here is um, jokingly, has been commonly and jokingly referred by many as the Costa Rican striptease map. So the first part, the, the 1940s began the development process in the country. So there was a small population initially and it was swelled by mass migration, especially from Europe. So at that time, the flows of people were going in that direction, many of them escaping the war. And the government had this very generous land settlements, um, and you could basically claim any amount of land you could, provided that you showed development. And it usually meant you cut down the trees and you put a cow, and that's enough to demonstrate um, development of the land. So from individual fortune seekers to the large United Fruit Company type of uh, deals, virtually in exchange for nothing, uh, the country was stripped of its um, natural cover, I'd say for a few paper parks um, that you see kind of scattered around. So there were all these islands in the country. Uh, many of these parks remain unpaid, they were just created by decree, but people living inside. And you know, it's very similar situation to many other places. Um, add on this, during the 80s, we had the Central America War, we had every single economic crisis that you can name off, um, uh, fuel crisis, uh, well, the petrol crisis, sugar crisis, all kind of coffee crisis, um, and a massive hyperinflation. So the, the situation was really bleak at the time. Um, there were also good things. There were good things that happened at the time. So the, at, at the end of the 1940s, the country abolished the army. So it freed up resources to invest in in uh, water and sanitation throughout the country, in electrification, um, education for everybody, free health system, again, across the country. So there were good things in there, but it was very clear what was given in, what was going um, as the price to be paid in here. In the beginning of the 90s, we begin to see a big change. Um, it begins to come uh, to creep and come almost by a surprise. So we had the 1992 Rio, um, the, the Rio Convention that was very inspiring for a small group of conservation people that were really um, key drivers into this. The Kyoto Protocol brought huge hopes. We were going to be producing the carbon that the rest, um, the, the rest of the world was going to be paying for. Um, of course, it didn't quite happen at the time, but it began to grow into this this element of maybe we can do something to change this. Um, and we, uh, these people, these visionaries began to think about what can we do to change these incentives as well. 
there were other things that were happening. The IMF and the World Bank came with a structural adjustment plan that said you need to eliminate all subsidies. So the previous um, reforestation subsidies had to be rethought. So this is when this idea of um, introducing payments for ecosystem services, not a subsidy, it's a payment for keeping your forest, um, was introduced. And the conservation community said, hold on, it's not just for reforestation. You also need to pay for conservation. So it came in and it opened a small window that became the, the catalyzer for this big change. Very, very important as well. Not just the PES, it was very small at the time, but a big thing that happened was that the meat prices collapsed internationally. So a lot of people began to abandon the lands because it was cheaper to leave it abandoned and then um, than, than try to be keeping um, cows that they couldn't sell anymore. So um, restoration began to happen quite quickly. It's a tropical country, but it was very fragile. So we needed things to really um, change the way that this was happening and protect this small um, change in the trend and see what we could do. So the payment for ecosystem services came in at that time when we needed to change and, and to, to introduce this, um, to, to support and nurture this change. So if we go to the last one. So the payments for ecosystem services, as you know, it, it, is, it is a reward, a cash um, that is given to landowners in exchange of implementing certain activities. We may be called nature-based solutions. There is, we're talking about strict protection of existing forests or um, ecosystems. It could be restoration uh, through reforestation. It could be sustainable forest management, and it could also be agroforestry to talk about other and to try to bring more of these um, fragmented um, and work in this fragmented landscape. However, the, the program is not really a market-based um, instrument as most people want to um, sometimes refer to it. It is really um, and truly um, a governance um, element, an institution, a set of institutions that govern this collective undertaking of um, not, um, looking after nature. So it looks about, it talks about, we divide it in here. So I have in here, we have a set of um, incentive that go into landowners. So first of all, there was a law that was introduced and it said, you're not allowed to cut down forests anymore. That's it. So it was extremely difficult to implement and many people were against it. But what this law did was to reduce the opportunity cost of protecting this forest. Uh, there were also zonings introduced uh, saying, OK, there will be areas where this is absolutely strict and there is no negotiation in there. Of course, there's many laws like this, so it depends on monitoring and people will continue to break the law. But while that was done, there was also the reward, the payment that was introduced. And they said, OK, well, you're not allowed to do that, but you can also claim for this payment for ecosystem service for, for, for protecting this forest. So there is a compensation, not full, but it compensates at least that opportunity cost of breaking the law. So it was that entry point. And then as well as providing this money, it provides systems, support systems to enable people to actually comply. There is the technical support. There's a huge element of um, forestry um, attention and then biology has begun to be created and all of this. So th there was all of these systems that were supporting the actions that the landowner was going to do. It was not just a simple, OK, we give you money and you have to do this. So on the other hand, where is this money coming from? The other key bit of this program is that there is a very clear element of the government acting on behalf of society, capturing and acknowledging that these are um, social benefits that need to also be rewarded. So the government on behalf of the society, working with the finance ministry, uh, working with through the central bank, um, begins to develop and, and, and um, improve systems to capture revenue. So we're talking about the fuel subsidies, so a percentage of that goes into payment for ecosystem services. We're talking about water uh, taxes as well, and the different sets of money that comes into um, um, the are earmarked, part of them for payments for ecosystem services, but also part for other things. It goes, some of them go to protect national parks and so on. 
there is also a lot of talk about and a lot of work on trying to phase out these harmful subsidies and see how they can be put into the new pot of positive incentives. So this is a still, it goes on and off. There's um, this huge powerful groups in the coffee um, groups and the sugar and you know it's it, it's not easy but it is there it is there and it, it evolves um, as the program grows um, importantly in there all the things to, to demonstrate the impact on society we also use um, natural capital accounts that were introduced more recently and they're really useful to understand the multiplier impacts across the economy but also to help design uh, new taxes, for example, the carbon tax that is being currently designed. And, um, and then it creates these institutions to capture these resources, to put them in a sustainable way, safe as well, so that they can be invested properly. And it creates this, uh, systems and logistics that um, support this um, program implementer to manage the finances to support the landowners and to constantly be exploring new deals to implement and to measure and to monitor um, and to also drive ambition internationally. So um, I will stop here. Um, just very important thing to remember in here is not just a payment in the vacuum. There's a whole set that goes in there. It's not something that it's a snapshot of what it is now. It has gone through a huge amount of changes over 20 years. It is not for poverty reduction, although it has very important benefits on um, rural areas. But um, the very important thing is that managing that financial uh, solidity of the program.